Um, so I'm going to talk about the role of the financial sector in um, dealing with natural disasters and crises and try to learn some lessons, especially uh, some lessons for maybe Japan's financial sector that might be helpful for other countries in Asia. Um, so the presentation will consist of six parts. First, I want to look a little bit about J the recovery of exports in Japan and in Thailand from the disasters. I want to then think a little bit about how Japan maintained business continuity in the financial sector. It basically seems that Japan had very well thought out plans before the disaster hit. And it seems like that's one of the lessons is that the better our business continuity plans are before the disaster hits, the more likely the financial sector is to keep operating well. Then I want to look a little bit about insurance in ASEAN. Um, some World Bank researchers have shown that having sufficient insurance in place before a disaster is one of the best ways to recover after a disaster. So I want to look a little bit about insurance in ASEAN, um, talk a little bit about fostering growth in ASEAN, about pursuing ASEAN financial integration, and, and then conclude. Um, so what we, what we know and what we've talked about a lot is that both Japan and Thailand had major catastrophes in 2011. So Japan experienced a magnitude 9 earthquake, 16,000 people died, the damages exceeded um, uh, 200 uh, billion. Um, as Mannheim said, this was the greatest, the most expensive natural disaster ever. Um, it was also the largest earthquake in Japanese recorded history. It was associated with the, the nuclear problems, electrical distru disruption. The popular press highlighted all the problems uh, associated with supply chains. So it was actually a, a serious disaster. But if we look at Japanese um, exports, so this is Japanese exports over the last 30 years. We see a major drop with the global financial crisis, but I really can't see any drop here due to the Japanese earthquake. So this disaster, which was uh, one of the worst in history, seemed to have no lasting effect on Japanese exports. Um, if we look at Thai exports, we see a pretty uh, we see a fall with the global financial crisis, but we also see a very marked fall with the Thai floods, which people have talked about earlier today. Um, so it seems that Japan was able to um, recover very, very quickly from this uh, major disaster. So the first thing I wanted to do is just test more formally whether there was any impact from the earthquake on Japanese exports. So, um, to, and also what, whether there was an impact on Thai exports. So let me, uh, to do this, I just estimated a very standard workhorse model, the imperfect substitutes model, trying to explain exports based on the real exchange rate um, output in importing countries. So I'm trying to control for other factors. In controlling for those, see, does the earthquakes and the floods still affect exports? Um, so I got data on the volume of exports for Japan and Thailand from the CEIC database. I got data on real exchange rates from the um, International Monetary Fund for Japan and the Bank of International Settlements for Thailand. So the Japanese data were available from before 1980. The Thai exchange rate data were available starting in 1994. So for Japan, I used data from 1980 onwards. For Thailand, from uh, 1994 onwards. Um, and then I captured the effect of the Great Japan Earthquake and the Thai floods using dummy variables um, to measure foreign GDP, I looked at uh, 13 major importing countries for both Japan and for Thailand. So for Japan, I used Australia, Canada, China, Germany, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, United Kingdom, United States. For Thailand, I used the same countries except I replaced Thailand with Japan. And then I took, took a weighted average of income growth in those 13 countries to measure rest of the world GDP. Um, the, to specify the model, augmented Tiki Fuller test indicated the variables were integrated of order one. Uh, the trace and maximum eigenvalue statistics permitted rejection of the null hypothesis of no co-integration, suggesting there's a co-integrating relationship between those variables. So then I estimated um, um, this export function using an error correction model. And um, the coefficient here, alpha one, uh, test whether exports move back to their equilibrium value. So if they do, we would expect this to be negative, stati statistically significant. Um, sorry, this is very small for these results. Um, so basically, uh, I, I apologize, these are so small. So 
The, this is the equation for Japanese exports. These are the equation for Thai exports. Uh, the results indicated that there was one co-integrating relationship um, between the variables. Uh, the exchange rate variable and the income variable come out statistically significant and an expected sign. Uh, the error correction coefficient is negative and statistically significant here at about the 6% uh, level here at the 5% level, suggesting that exports move back to their equilibrium values. So basically the model seems to fit fairly well. But if we look at an earthquake dummy, it's, it's negative, but it's not at all statistically significant. So the value would suggest that exports fell by about 8% uh, after the earthquake hit, but there's no sign, it's not statistically significant. I tried it for uh, the quarter after, two quarters after, there's still no evidence of any uh, decline in exports. Whereas in the case of Thailand, it suggests that exports fell by about 25%. So, so what this is saying is this major catastrophe that hit Japan had very little effect on exports. And I look in the paper at, more specifically, at electronic parts and components, auto parts and components, and again, you don't see any evidence that those were affected um, by the uh, earthquake. So it seems that uh, Japan was very well able to cope with the earthquake. And there's many reasons for that, but one reason, one helpful factor in Japan was um, the, the financial sector um, maintained business continuity. And so I wanted to look at, see if there's any lessons that other countries in Asia could learn from what Japan did following this major disaster. And we know that the financial sector is part of the vital infrastructure of the economy. So if it continues to function, if banks continue to function, if insurance companies continue to function, that helps maintain confidence, that helps uh, ease anxiety. So the financial sector can play a very major role after a natural disaster. So if we look at what Japan did after the natural disaster, um, we'll see it's very, very detailed planning and preparation. So for instance, the Financial Services Administration has direct responsibility for the financial sector. And the FSA had a, a detailed plan in place for how to respond. Um, and so this plan included managing a disaster countermeasures headquarter directed by the head of the FSA, and then working with the uh, DCMs of other parts of the government, uh, the Ministry of Finance, the Bank of Japan, and others, uh, managing and assigning staff, monitoring financial markets and institutions, providing us information to financial markets, uh, maintaining the internet technology, and asking financial institutions to provide support for crisis victims. So one problem they were ready for in, in the case of Tokyo is that the public transportation wasn't working very well right after the earthquake. And so the FSA then, in order to ensure that there's enough employees, even if public transportation isn't, is interrupted, they find staff members who are located close to the close enough to the head office that they could walk in. And so they get a reserve group of those employees who are not doing other essential operations. So in an emergency, those ones can walk into the office and be available to take on emergency functions. And then they have a priority checklist. So for the people who come to the office after an emergency, there's a checklist so they know what needs to be done. In case the head of the FSA, the minister, is unavailable, they have a succession of authority of seven people. So if the head isn't there, they, they know who's in charge. If the second person isn't there, they know who is. And then for each of the priority operations, they have successions up to five people. So they've planned out who's going to be in charge in the case of an emergency. Um, the FSA then worked together with the Bank of Japan. So the, the Bank of Japan, the central bank, um, offer, also established a DCH to maintain, and maintain business continuity. And so together, the FSA and the BOJ asked financial institutions to provide support to victims of the crisis. So one of the things which they asked uh, the, the banks to do, and which the banks did, they asked them to remain open and to be very flexible in allowing depositors to identify themselves and to give money. So one problem after disaster is your passbook might burn, you might um, not have a lot of identification. And so the financial regulators ask banks to be very flexible in providing deposits to customers. They also asked insurance companies to use aerial photography 
in order to expedite the handling of claims. So um, there was aerial photography, uh, claims were settled very quickly. So both the insurance companies and the banks were very flexible in responding to the needs of customers. Um, other things that the uh, uh, BOJ and, and the SSA did, they tried to maintain as much normal functioning as they could, and one thing they did is they provided very timely information. So there's a lot of rumors which were spreading, which could have caused panic. And so the BOJ and the FSA tried to dispel those rumors and provide as much correct information as they could. Financial institutions in Japan, banks and other institutions, worked uh, closely with each other. So for instance, if one institution had a, a car which was delivering cash, it would send that car to another institution, a competitor, to make sure that uh, institution also had adequate cash on hand. Many people had to evacuate far away from their homes. They didn't have a lot of documentation, so they would, and their, one of their financial institutions might not have been located where they were, so they would go to another financial institution in a remote city. That other institution would somehow verify their identity. That financial institution would call the customer's own institution in a diff different city the only institution would authorize giving money to them, so they would give money to the customers of another bank. So the financial infrastructure of, of Japan was really uh, uh, widened by the fact that the banks were working together in the crisis. Um, and then in Tohoku, um, many of the clearinghouses weren't working, so other clearinghouses picked up this activity for them to make sure that the, the payments and clearing mechanism were working. Um, the major financial markets like the stock market, the, the foreign exchange market already had business continuity plans in place. So the trade associations checked with the participants, tried to get information. They ascertained that no changes were, were needed, so they, they opened up and continued to function and they were able to handle the huge surge in uh, financial market activity associated with the crisis. So the, the Bank of Japan also uh, surveys every year um, banks to make sure they have good business continuity plans in place. They publicize these surveys to try to uh, give financial institutions better ideas about how to maintain business continuity. Um, so for instance, some of the questions they ask are, are what causative events are the banks preparing for? So earthquakes, infectious diseases, etc. Um, they want to know how likely the primary and the backup workplaces are to be functioning depending on the different disasters. Um, they want to know um, how, how soon priority operations can be restored. Um, they want to know how the banks have cooperative frameworks works with other banks. Uh, they want to make sure that they have a business continuity staff in place, people who can come to the office in an emergency. Um, they want to know that staff are being trained for crisis situations. They want to know that they actually have um, electric generators, fuel, other, other things in place. Um, so I was talking to my children about this who are, are much more up on the technology and they were a little bit surprised by a lot of this. They, when they heard that the FSA was using leaflets and radios to get information out, they thought really they need like better technology. So my son was saying they really need to boost uh, bolster the cell towers, have satellite technology, have some way to use um, more sophisticated technology in a crisis, not just distributing leaflets. Um, and maybe use solar power instead of relying on generators where you might not get fuel. So um, the technology could definitely be improved. Um, but anyway, so the Japan had a very uh, detailed business continuity plan in place. They seem to continually update it. And so they seem to have a lot of prior planning which can help in a crisis. So I want to go and talk a little bit about insurance in, in uh, ASEAN. So two World Bank researchers have just written a paper, published a paper where uh, they investigated the response of GDP, budget deficits, and other variables to catastrophes. And what they found was that countries with higher insurance penetration levels uh, did not on average experience drops in GDP or increases in their budget deficit. And so what they concluded was the most efficient way to be prepared for a crisis was to have a high level of insurance penetration. Um, and so these countries, the private insurance can pay for many of the reconstruction costs, and so governments can focus on emergency aid relief. Um, so one of the things I tried to do was investigate how, what is the insurance coverage of ASEAN countries. 
Um, and so to do this, I focused on the insurance penetration ratio for insurance companies other than life insurance companies. So um, this is a ratio of total insurance premiums other than life insurance premiums relative to GDP. So as Lee and Takagi have noted, this is a key measure of the amount of insurance in a country. Um, and I transformed, following uh, a paper by Milo in the Journal of Risk and Insurance, I, transferred, I transformed these data into per capita terms. So I looked at two measures. One is the real US dollars per capita spent on non-life insurance, and the second is the purchasing power parity US dollars per capita spent on non-life insurance. And so what Milo did is regress this variable on the uh, log of per capita GDP in a series of fixed effect variables. So I followed him in doing this estimation. Um, the details are all in the paper, so let me just jump to the results. And so what I found was that um, an increase in real GDP per capita increases life expenditure uh, expenditures on uh, non-life insurance premiums by about 1.22% in both cases. Um, and I tested the hypothesis if this was equal to one, and I could reject that. So what that indicates is that uh, basically expenditure on um, insurance is a, is a luxury good. So that as, as GDP increases by 1%, expenditure on insurance increases by more than 1%. So this suggests that one of the ways to increase insurance coverage is just for an economy to grow. And as it grows, insurance uh, premiums tend to grow more than uh, one for one. So then I was trying to look at Based on uh, Milo's model, if we look at ASEAN countries, what is the level of insurance? Is it, or is insurance penetration more than we would expect, less than we would expect? And so these are the results for the Philippines. Um, so the red line is the predicted expenditure, the blue line is the actual expenditure. So they seem to track each other pretty closely. So in the last couple years of the sample, Predicted expenditures are a little bit less than actual expenditures, but they track each other pretty closely. If we look at Indonesia, we get, they seem to also track each other pretty closely. In the last few years, predicted expenditures are a little more than actual. But for both Indonesia and for the Philippines, one thing that really struck me is these levels are, are seem fairly low. So this is like $10 uh, per capita. This is like $13 per capita. If we compare that with Malaysia, we get values of something like $380 per capita. So in Malaysia, actual and predicted seem to track each other pretty closely, but the, the expenditures are much, much higher. And even in Thailand, they're, they're maybe five times higher than in Indonesia in the Philippines. So what this was suggesting to me is that the insurance penetration uh, levels in Indonesia and in the Philippines, even if they're about what we predict, are, are very low. Um, and I think what Mannheim said earlier, how the Philippines has so many natural disasters, and Indonesia does also, so the fact that insurance uh, penetration is so low there um, suggests to me that it's, it's less than optimal, it's less than we need. Um, and The Economist magazine just ran an article where they said that Asia is woefully underinsured. So then, based on that model, I was thinking, how could we increase um, insurance penetration in Indonesia and the Philippines? And it seems like one of the most straightforward ways is just to try to nurture growth, encourage growth in those countries. Um, and there's an article by uh, we, where he said for ASEAN countries like the Philippines and Indonesia, economic growth could be nurtured if companies could advance from simple to complex production activities, from low skilled assembling to participating in the engineering and design aspects of production. And so one way to accomplish this would be for these economies to attract FDI and become more linked with regional uh, value chains. So this is a point which uh, Kimura Sensei and others have made that as you become more uh, linked with global value chains, there's um, technology transfer and spillovers. Um, and so one way to think about how we can help these, uh, how these countries can become more linked with global value chains is to again use per, uh, Professor Kimura and Professor Ando's framework 
where they explained that firms would fragment production and slice up the value chain when the production cost savings arising, arising from fragmentation exceeds the cost of linking geographically separated production blocks. And some ways to lower the service link cost are strengthening physical infrastructure, such as uh, highways, ports, and airports, ICT infrastructure, container yards, and market supportive uh, institutional infrastructure. So just looking at the Philippines and Indonesia, I am looking at uh, data from the most recent World Economic Forum, Global Competitive Index, and it suggests that Indonesia and the Philippines have a lot of room to improve in the areas of infrastructure and corruption. So uh, I have all the data in the paper, and actually it seems like the Philippines has improved a lot over the last four years, but it's still rated 81st in terms of ethics and corruption. So it seems like there's a lot of room for improving infrastructure and fighting corruption in Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, also, uh, uh, Professor Urata and his colleagues have shown that um, the more educated the workforce is, the more likely technology transfer is um, to take place. So I talk a little bit in the paper about how there's a lot of room to uh, promote human capital formation starting at a young age in ASEAN. Um, another, let me go on to talk a little bit about uh, strengthening the financial markets in ASEAN countries. So another finding of these World Bank researchers is that countries with more developed financial markets recover more quickly from natural disasters. So when countries have efficient bond markets, the governments can borrow at lower costs to finance spending on emergency relief and infrastructure reconstruction. So they, they presented uh, would look like fairly strong evidence that the, the stronger, more efficient the financial markets are, uh, the more quickly countries recover from natural resources, from natural industrials. Um, so four IMF uh, researchers have just noted that ASEAN financial integration can stimulate financial sector development and lead to deeper, more efficient financial markets. Uh, and it could also, they argue, promote more innovative financial insurance products which could help develop vibrant insurance markets in the region. Um, so the ASEAN economic community is pursuing regional financial integration, um, and integration, financial integration is currently weaker in ASEAN than in other economically linked regions such as Europe, um, and Professor Nakagi has noted that financial integration can help foster a local currency funded bond market. Um, integration could also help channel Asian savings to investments in Asia, rather than sending the savings out of the region and then bringing it back in. Uh, Aldaba and Yap have noticed that integra integration will contribute to greater portfolio diversification, so to uh, uh, stronger financial markets. Um, and ASEAN countries are currently heavily, heavily bank dependent, so it would be desirable to promote bond market uh, development. Um, and ASEAN countries have a lot of the supervisory and regulatory framework for this, but the bond markets are still underdeveloped in many ASEAN countries. So that's uh, an order that something they can work on. One, one suggestion has been if you improve the credit rating, rating agencies, this can foster bond market development. Um, but whenever you're dealing with reforming the financial sector, there's lots of risks, there's lots of dangers, everything needs to be carefully phased and sequenced. But provided the countries in the region follow the ASEAN way of safe, gradual decision making, integration offers the potential to develop more efficient financial markets that can make regional economies more resilient in the face of natural disasters. So then just to conclude, what we saw is that Japanese exports recovered very rapidly uh, from the largest earthquake in recorded history. One reason that the Japanese economy was able to continue to function well is the financial sector was very resilient in the face of the crisis. Um, also, adequate insurance coverage is the most efficient way, according to the World Bank, to prepare for a disaster. And insurance coverage seems very low in the Philippines and Indonesia, su suggesting that these countries have room to keep developing um, and strengthen their insurance markets. Also, uh, countries with deeper and more efficient debt markets tend to recover more quickly from catastrophes. So pursuing financial integration in ASEAN could stimulate uh, financial sector development and lead to deeper, more efficient financial markets and lead to more innovative financial products. And 
Another reason why we might, let me go back to the previous figure, but another reason why we might want to have innovative financial markets in Asia is when we look at these disasters, they have a very large effect on um, exports, but they're really dwarfed by the effect of things like the global financial crisis. So if we look at the global financial crisis, it's had a huge effect, whereas the natural disasters have a smaller effect. And if we were to develop very vibrant financial markets in ASEAN, we could develop financial instruments, derivatives instruments, which could help insure firms against, say, a, a drop in income in the rest of the world. And that could give firms one more tool to deal with these crisis, crises which are afflicting um, Asia. Thank you very much.